something to say. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie and you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and you actually will be knowing me better in that way. I finished recording the audiobook today. That doesn't mean that it's done because now all that audio has to be edited, but the recording is done. And there was much rejoicing, at least with me and in my heart. Okay, so I wanted to talk about something broadly and specifically on today's episode. Namely, now that the audio is completely recorded, one of the things that I'm going to be doing is starting a second podcast. And it's going to be called Mask of the Gods, and I'll give you more information when that is available. Probably going to launch in a week or two, and it will have the audio of the book. So you'll be able to listen to it for free unless you decide to become a community support member, which you can always do down in the comments. So, yay. I'm really excited about that, to be able to share this book that I've been working on for two years with you. And as part of that, I'm going to be spending more time on this podcast talking about my own writing and the story. Now, don't worry, don't worry. No, nothing's changing too much. I'm still going to be talking about various shows and doing reviews of things and, you know, trying to broaden out the topics into as writing as much as I can. But I see this podcast as a wonderful place for me to talk about my world building and my idea of story and structure and how that influenced the writing of the book. So the good news is you only have to buy a copy of Crucify My Love if you want to, and I will love you forever for that. I'll let you know when the book is available to purchase. But if you want to follow along with everything as we're going, each week there will be an episode out with chapters of the book in it, and you can listen to that for free and follow along. I, I'm very excited about that, mainly because I've never really taken the time to go through a book like this. And I actually find that's true for a lot of writers. I mean, the writing life is so weird. And since I know quite a few of you listening are writers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We spend months, sometimes years, like I said, I've been working on this book for two years, when you actually get to hear the intro music for Crucify, I made that song in 2017. And it's just been sitting there and I listen to it every now and then to inspire my work. But yeah, I've been working on this for quite some time. And then we finish and the book goes out into the ether and we go on to the next thing. And you know, yes, we spend a portion of our time doing marketing and trying to get people to read our books, but we don't actually spend time with them. And this is a trend that I've noticed a lot over the years. I know quite a few writers because we smell each other. We can we make a sound that only other writers can hear. I don't know what it is, but when I go to conventions, we just happen to sit next to each other and start talking and then you get to that awkward part of so what do you do oh i'm here with my book oh i am too dot 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 yeah it happens a lot so here we are talking about what we do as writers and the one thing that we don't do is talk about our work and i'm not saying that in the way that like yes there are some writers who are prolific in discussing their work and they do media tours and all of that. I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is how often we're concerned with our whip, with our work in progress, and not so much with the books that we have either just released 
or have released in the past. And I find that weird because I remember when I met one author, and I won't say who he is, just because, and we were talking and I learned that among the many things that he had done was he had developed a comic book with someone. And as you all know, that's something that I would love to do. And I just got a message with some webcomic recommendations. And thank you for that. I love getting messages. And I'm going to check those out. And it will be included on a review episode when I talk about that. But when I, when I heard that he had done a comic, I wanted to talk to him about it. One, what the comic was, and if he had a copy of it, because I probably would have bought one. And also, how he did that. Because he was very clear that he wasn't an artist, and he met somebody that was, and the two of them collaborated on this project. Well, I like to draw, but I am not a comic book artist. By any stretch of the imagination. I know, I've tried. Desperately, over the years. But the more I tried to get him to talk about the project, the less he wanted to do it. Which, to me, was a shame twofold. One, I would have loved to hear about it. But also, we had gathered a small crowd around us while we were talking, and it would have been a perfect opportunity for him to sell copies of that book, which I later found out he did have on him. Why are we reluctant to talk about our work? Not our works in progress. For goodness sakes, I could open Twitter right now and I could show you a dozen, if not a hundred writers talking about their current work in progress. You've, if especially if you follow me on Twitter, I talk a lot about my work with Crucify My Love and the other projects that I'm working on. But that's pretty much as far as it goes. I, I don't know why we don't take the time to celebrate the works that we have done, and the works that we are planning to do. We're always stuck in this future mode as writers. And I understand that to a certain degree. I know for myself, I have about nine or 12 books that I'm wanting to write that are kind of sitting in my queue, waiting for me to get around to them. Most writers are like that. We have a bunch of ideas that We're just chomping at the bit to get to. So that can breed a certain amount of, you know, whip excitement. Let me tell you about my work in progress. Because it's live, it's in our heads, and it's what we're currently working on. And when we get together, very often, that's what we discuss. If not just weird random things not necessarily associated with writing because, you know, generally at these times we're at an event that we just left a panel where we're talking about our work. But I think it would benefit us if, I don't know, the way I've been thinking about this is I should be my own number one fan. And I know that sounds egotistical, but bear with me, especially if you're a writer. I think this is really important. I want to love the work that I do as much as, if not more, and hopefully more, than the work by other people that I consume and participate in. I should be a cheerleader for my own fandoms. So when I went into the process that I'm doing in the construction of the Mask of the Gods series and the World of the Ash Dancer in general, I wanted it to be something that I would fall in love with. I wanted it to be something that I would want to play with and participate in and really get down into it and just spend my time with. Because, well, like I said, I've already spent two years with this book. And I've already written the follow-up to it. And I already have ideas for what the third book's going to be. So here I am. And I get to spend all this time with the text. And as kind of tired of it as I am, because I've gone over every word so many times that in some ways they've lost all meaning, this time through having to record the audiobook and bring it to life and actually try to 
bring into my voice as well as I can the emotions of the characters involved, it reminded me of that instinct that I have, that I want to be my own number one fan. I want to love my fiction as much as I love other people's, if not more. And so I find myself, when I'm talking to people, talking about my work. And not necessarily the dry stuff, though I do that sometimes, especially when people are like, well, I want to be an author. Oh, really? Let me explain to you what that is. Because a lot of people think writing is a very different craft than what it is. And we've actually done that episode, if you go back a bit. It's back there waiting for you. But, I don't know. (laughs) This is just something that I don't see a lot of other authors doing. And it has really bothered me over the years when I've met authors whose books I've really enjoyed and wanted to discuss them with them. They, I don't know. There's a certain distance there. And for some authors, I understand that. Like, when I first met Peter David, Peter David has written so much over his career, I can imagine it being difficult for him to remember a particular issue of The Incredible Hulk or, you know, a particular story that he wrote. And he's probably bombarded with that all the time. But for some of the other authors who are about at the same level that I am, where we have a small audience and we don't get peppered with questions all the time. I don't see why we are so reticent to talk about our work in the same way we talk about other people's. And maybe it goes to how egotistical that idea sounds, that you would take the time to praise your own work or extol its virtues. I remember talking with a friend of mine and he asked what one of my favorite things to do and was, and I said, it's theory craft about the worlds that I write in. And he looked at me like I was nuts, but it's, it's almost as surprising to me what happens in a novel as it is when I watch somebody else's work. So when I'm coming up with my ideas about what I think is going to happen in a story, that's almost on the same level as theory crafting for somebody else's work who I don't know their creative process mainly because over the years as I've become a pantser the story kind of goes where it wants to go and yeah it may need to be reined in in an edit or something but the end goal that I see in my head even when it happens and that uh, it still happens. It never gets there in the way I thought it was going to get there. And often the answer isn't the answer that I thought it was going to be because through the process of writing, a better answer presented itself. And so I do spend quite a bit of time theory crafting, if you will, in my own settings, in my own worlds trying to figure out, well, exactly how is the third book in the Mask of the Gods series going to end? Mainly because I've read book one and two, and soon you'll get to read book one, and I'm so excited! (laughs) And if you don't know this feeling, see, I, I, I used to think that I was crazy, because, you know, not every author has that experience, and then I read Terry Brooks's autobiography, Sometimes the Magic Works, and saw that he has very much that that experience in writing, and I no longer felt alone. And that made me very happy because I didn't know that there were other authors out there like me, because you don't always meet them. But I think we should be talking about our work, and I think we should be talking about it in depth, and I think we should be sharing our passion. To me, this is one of the things that I find lacking in a lot of modern, especially genre fiction, is I don't see that passion that I used to see. And we should 
to be the first ones to bring that back. I remember when I was a kid, and I used to watch interviews with... Well, actually, start when I was a little, little kid, and we used to watch The Wonderful World, World of Disney, and Walt Disney would intro the stories. I don't know if he was alive or not when I was alive. That w- That was something that never you know, dawned on me, but we used to watch the wonderful world of Disney and there was Walt explaining where these things came from. And that was magic. And you could see the light in his eyes, the passion that he had for it. The same with interviews with Jim Henson or George Lucas or Gene Roddenberry. I remember sitting and listening to interviews with Ray Bradbury and just being astounded at how his mind worked. And there was a thrill there. And a a lot of us have lost that thrill of writing and creating these worlds. Because one of the first things that we are taught and told to think about in this capitalist society of ours is how is that going to make you money? And if you want to be gross for a minute, talking about your own fiction is a great way to make money. Because if you can share your passion for the project with others, that passion might just be infectious enough that they buy a copy of your work. But beyond that, if I am not passionate about the work that I'm doing, and if you are not passionate about the work that you're doing, how can we expect other people to invest their time and energy into that project? And that, for me, is the wonderful thing that the internet allows us to do. Be it the social, through social media, YouTube, podcasts like this one. We can share our love for the worlds, for the characters, for the stories that we tell with others in a way that is so intimate and so personal. We can share our insights about the writing process and the creative process in general and the world building that goes into every little thing so that in the end we're sharing our story not just the one that's on the page but the one that no one ever gets to see that deeper thing behind the curtain that love that energy that motivation that drove us to tell the story in the first place I remember when Willow came out and there were these interviews with George Lucas and various of the other various other people involved. And honestly, I don't remember if they interviewed the actors at all because they were talking about the technology that they developed to be able to film that movie, to add motion blur to the models. So they looked realer than what you would conventionally see in a movie like this and all of the work that went into it and the story and building it up. And that made me fall in love with Willow before I ever saw it. Because in those people, I saw passion. I saw that energy that I want to be a part of. It's like listening to Paul Stanley talk about music or Ben Burt talk about sound design or John Williams talk about making the score for a very for the various projects that he's worked on it's why there are certain and I stress that certain directors commentaries that are phenomenal to listen to and others that are boring you can tell in the tone and tenor of their voice if this was a paycheck job You really can. Like listening to Lord and Miller talk about their work in Into the Spider-Verse is thrilling. There's something phenomenal about the passion that you see them bring to the work and the various thoughts and ideas that went through their head as they came up with that brilliant movie, that wonderful story, that ingenious way of making the animation look and hearing them talk about the origins of all of that 
excited me so much. And my husband, because we watched it at the same time, we, we went and rewatched the movie because we just needed to see it again. But we needed to see it again through not only the passion that they brought with it, but these subtle little things that we would have missed and that we did miss when we watched it until they pointed it out and we went back through and we saw these subtle little things. Like, for example, and I don't think this is a spoiler but because I'm not really talking about any events that happen, but there's a moment in the movie where Miles and Peter are swinging through the woods and they're so out of sync and Peter's trying to teach Miles how to use the web slinger. And you notice that slowly they fall into sync. Well, see, the way they did that is they only animated on the twos, which means f for each f each frame of animation appears twice. So say you're watching it, say the, they did it at 60 frames per second. That would mean only 30 frames of motion were included. So every two frames that consecutively follow each other were exactly the same. And when they filmed that scene, when they recorded that scene, when they animated that scene, they actually put the animation between Miles and Peter out of sync. And slowly, as they're coming together, they actually move the frame rate into sync and it's a subtle thing. It's really like something that my eye is not trained to pick up on. I know some people are much more sensitive to frame rate than I am, but once I knew it was there and could watch for it, it brought that entire sequence to life in a way that it hadn't been the first time I saw it because I could see this brilliant, subtle little thing that they worked into the story into this actual storytelling that made the feeling of what was going on work better. That's what I mean when I say we should talk about our work. We should be proud of those moments. We should take pride in those moments because Lord knows there's so much in this world trying to tear us down. I mean, if you're not an author and you want to know what that feels like, just tell someone in your life that you're thinking of being a writer professionally and just listen to the unsolicited advice that immediately comes back at you. I mean, we've talked about this before on the show, but people say things to writers that they would never say to other people. And so when we find something to be happy when we find something that makes us happy, when we find something that motivates us or moves us or makes us want to move forward, we need to share that. We need to celebrate that. We don't get that many moments as authors because it's not as collaborative a project as movies or music even. So we have to find those moments where we can talk, where we can share, where we can celebrate for our own mental health and well-being, those things that give us life, that give us hope, that give us strength to move on and to move forward. And if we don't take the time to do that, we'll start wondering why we feel burnt out. Why do we feel beaten down? Why do we feel hollow? Why is the work not satisfying? Well, if you're not taking the time to savor those moments, if you're not taking the time to celebrate those moments, they're just going to pass you by. Don't become a streamer of your own content. Whatever you're making, be it art or music or books or anything, don't just do it and move on. Don't just do it and let it go and run on to the next thing. Take some time. Celebrate. Find the joy in it. You need to feed your own creative fires so that you have them 
to get you through the next project. Can you imagine what would have happened back in the day if J.R. Tolkien had access to podcasts? What if Frank Herbert had access to podcasts? You're telling me that they wouldn't be talking about their own work? That they wouldn't be talking about the theories underlying their own work? That Tolkien wouldn't have made a podcast specifically to teach people each of his created languages? You're telling me that wouldn't happen. Really? I'm supposed to believe that. For goodness sakes, Gene Roddenberry was so excited about the work that he used to do. He used to do interview albums. They existed. You can still find them. They're hard to find, but you can still find them. I think they put a lot of them together in a podcast, if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah, because he wanted to share this amazing world that he had constructed, this amazing world that he believed in so much. And you can say whatever you want to say about that, and whether that's self-aggrandizement or what have you. But you have to pat yourself on the back sometimes. Because the world isn't always going to do it for you. And if you're not celebrating your work, even if it's just in private, I'm not saying everybody has to do it out loud like I do, and like I'm planning to do, but if you're not celebrating your own work, why on earth would you expect anybody else to do it? You're closer to that story than anyone else will ever be. So if you can't celebrate it, if you can't go on and on and on about it and be part of your own fandom and celebrate your own work and your own stories and everything that exists in them, how can you expect other people to do it? Like I said, don't worry too much. I'm not going to be changing up this podcast all that much. I do want to spend some time talking about the things that are happening in the story and in the world. But like I said, I'm not expecting you to have to buy anything. They'll be there for you to listen to in their own podcast. And I'll give you all that information as soon as they're available. I'm so excited about all this, and I hope that you are too. If you like this episode and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this episode or the podcast in general, please do so. That helps me out a lot. It tells the algorithm to share me with more people. If you got a dollar, you can throw my way. Down in the show notes, you'll see a link that says Anchor Community Support. If you click that, you can join the project at the $1, $5, or $10 levels. That helps out a lot. That helps me do everything that I'm doing. You have no idea. Thank you so much to everybody who does that. If you don't have the money right now or you just don't feel like doing that, that's fine. Just, if you know anybody you think would like this, please share it with them. That helps out a lot, too. And, like I said, I'm very excited because we actually got a call in, and I'll be featuring it on the show soon. I just actually want to check out the webcomics that were um, recommended before I do that. But thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to call you Jack. It says J A C in the uh, attribution, so hope you don't mind, but thank you. If you want to contact me, you can either hit me up on Twitter, I'm C. Dorset on Twitter, you can find me there, I'm there way too much, or you can do what Jack did and go to anchor.fm, download the Anchor app, follow Project Shadow, and then you'll see a button that says Anchor Community Support. If you click that, you can leave me a message, keep it clean so I can use it on the show, it can be a question, a comment, or a topic you'd like to hear me discuss on the show. I would love to get more of those. I really want this to be our podcast, and that's one way that that can happen. If you want to keep up with everything I'm doing, just head over to projectshadow.com. You'll find links to everything over there. Alrighty. I think that's it. I am so excited. I'm so happy that I finally got the audiobook recorded. Now comes the, uh, fun part of going through and editing it. So, yay, I get to spend more time just listening to my own voice. Yay! Oh, that's gonna be fun. And until next time, you don't forget, have the fun. Bye.